Thank you very much. A uh, presiding pastor um, was introducing me, and he, uh, I remember um, this professor in my school, and then I introduced myself. And then the professor always says, Oh, you went to Pulmo One? The Pulmo is another food company. <laughs> So I'm the Changjong one is a company of the name of the food group here, popular in Korea. But um, yes, just as a presiding pastor have informed us, this is a really hot seminar because it was only a couple of days ago we had a book launching Thanksgiving service, and now we're here at the seminar to introduce this book to you. Whenever we prepare for the seminar. Um, we uh, do a deep research in the book, and we pull out a, a theme of our topic from the book to inform you, introduce you the book. However, this one will be a little different because this is a new release, right? So a lot of people haven't read the book yet. So today, um, we are going to uh, change uh, our pattern a little bit. Um, today, both of our lectures are going to be like the tour guide. Okay, we're going to guide and navigate this book, so how we should read this and what is this book is about. We're going to summarize this through this seminar and introduce Book 12 to you. Um, the title of the Book 12 is The Signs of the Covenant of Grace, Offerings, and the Book of the Law. So it begins with the Covenant of Grace. Covenant of Grace. What is Covenant of Grace? It's a grace. Uh, it's Covenant of Grace. What's covenant of grace? Covenant of works. It means the covenant is based upon the works. I mean, there's a work. The covenant is made. Without the works, the covenant is void. But the word grace means it's the other party is not qualified. The covenant is made not because we are qualified, but it's a unilateral act of God making covenant with those who are unworthy. God suggested, proposed a covenant first. That's why it's called the covenant of grace. And considering this covenant of grace, there are three formula. First means I will be and your descendants God. Concerning the relationship between God and the fallen mankind, there cannot be a relationship. Because we, the sinful man, have no link whatsoever to the holy divine God. God has no need to make this covenant with us, but God unilaterally comes to us and say, I will be your God. Simply put, I'm yours. I'm yours. And this is the covenant of grace indeed. Second formula of the covenant of grace is you shall be my people. Because God gave himself to us, our status, our status is no longer a sinner, but now transformed into the people of God. If you're citizens of Korea, you're to abide by the constitution of Korea. If you are part of the church of Presbyterian church, you have to abide by the Presbyterian, Presbyterian constitution. Same way, as we become the people of God, we have to follow the law of God. So earlier, God says, I am yours, and this time, you are mine. Okay? So it's very lovely, right? It's romantic. I'm yours, you're mine. Therefore, you cannot live separately. You have to be together. That's the third formula is I will dwell among you. I will dwell among you. So with the simple mankind, God proposes this covenant. And he says, I'm yours, you're mine, and we are together. So I think this will be easy way to remember what covenant of grace is. So through the history of redemption, God proclaims, I'm yours. He proposes the covenant. And secondly, he says, your mind transforms us into the holy people of God. And third, centered around the holy sanctuary, God dwells with us and leads into our eternal dwelling with our God in eternal heaven. 
this is the covenant of grace. And those who are partakers of the covenant of grace doesn't mean you're going to come with this brilliant shine or more handsome or taller. It's invisible. That's why God gave us signs of the covenant. Sign is ot in Hebrew. God is spirit. He is invisible. Because of this, God, sinful mankind cannot see God. So God gave us in these uh, means so we can come to know God. It's either through the word or listening to the word or reading the word. For example, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, God says he created the heavens, luminaries, the sun and the moon and stars. And they are signs of God because they are moving, not just randomly, but according to the precise timing of God to show his relationship with us. That is a sign of God. Also in Genesis chapter 17, verse 11, God gave a sign of circumcision to the covenant people so that whenever they see the circumcision on their flesh, they're able to realize, recognize, I am a covenant people. These are signs. So there are many signs that God gave to people, but up until then, it was a sign or covenant between God and a patriarch, one person. But now it's different. On Mount Sinai, God is making this contract or covenant with more than two million people. So here we see the most vivid signs of God. And some of the signs are the tabernacle, which we studied in Book 9, and also the offerings in the Book of Law, which we will study in Book 12. These are the most vivid signs that God gave us for this covenant of grace. So to... Um, when we compress all of these signs together, God proclaimed this word. And this, all of the signs of covenant is most vividly captured in one book in the Bible, and that is Leviticus. Now, Leviticus, the name of the book itself is profound. I would say, I'm going to read the Bible one time a year, and as you read on the Bible, the, the very first reading block comes now with the book of Leviticus. What is it cutting? What is to be offered? So confusing, so complicated. But no, that the book of Leviticus, that means Vikra, means he called. That Leviticus, actually the book's Hebrew name is Vikra, he called. He called. So when God calls us, it's like, why? When someone calls, you don't say that don't come. When you call, that means please come, right? Earlier, as we saw, even though we are completely unqualified to enter into covenant with God, God called us. And how the sinful man will come toward God and approach God, that entire process is recorded in the book of Leviticus. And that's why the book of Leviticus is not an ancient book that tells us about what the ancient sacrifices offering formulas were, but it is actually a book that was designed to teach us how we can go to God, how we can come closer to God. So the book of Leviticus can be um, likened to this. Let's say when we are going somewhere, we have to know the final destination. Where are we going to? We are going toward the heaven, kingdom of God. But just because you know the final destination, that doesn't mean you're going to successfully make there. The other one you have to know is you have to know the departure place. So when you want to uh, put in a Google your location, you have to input both the departure and the final destination. But if you put in the wrong place, um, even if you uh, enter the final destination, you're not going to get the direction to how to get there, right? So you see, Book of Leviticus and the law, we are informed what our starting point is. What does Leviticus tell us where we are starting from? The law defines everything in this world into four things, four stages. First is holiness. Holiness is the attribute of God, and not a single spot of sin can be found when there's holiness. In the Bible, 
holiness can be applied only to God Himself. Or, when God sets something apart for holiness on His own for that time, then can be holy. There's no way man can say, oh yeah, I think I'm some, a little bit holy. No, there's no such a thing in the Bible, right? Now the second, second phase is common, common. Or sometimes it can be called as profane. But the Hebrew actual word means common. Common means there's both good and bad. For good and evil. For example, we're watching TV at home. Is that a holy? Not holy. We know for sure it's not holy. <laughs> but, but just because you're watching TV, is that sin? No, that's not true either. Sometimes when we are sick or for when there is a COVID-19, um, it was hard for us to gather worship. So we worship online through the TV. Or when there is a, a, a election, then we can watch the ballot right through TV. Or at the end of the day, um, to recharge, you have to take a break, right? Watch TV. So TVs are being used as really good means. But it's so fun to watch TV. But it's the Lord's Day. It's 11 o'clock time to go to church. You're still watching TV. That's bad, right? So this good and bad both exist, and you call that common or and these two are distinguished by the word badal in Hebrew. In Leviticus chapter 10, verse 10 through 11, the mission of the priests is to differentiate between these two different areas. But badal does not have any middle ground. If it's white, it's white. If it's black, it's black. There's no gray. Especially if you look into the creation scene when God divided the heaven and earth and the water above the expanse and water below the expanse, God continues to divide and divide, and that very word divide is badal. There's no middle ground in this. There's either holy or common. Now, the common can be further divided into two sections, the clean versus unclean. Clean is being clean and pure, but unclean is where there is a stench of death. And this too can also be divided by the word vad badal. What is our starting point among these four? Oh, if we were to begin in holiness, that would be so nice, but that is not a starting point. That is a final destination. Only God can be holy. The law defines all of us. Our starting point is number four unclean. If you were to take any food that is defined by unclean, then we become unclean. So according to the law, the only answer we can give where our starting point is, is unclean state. But what's really thankful is that God does not completely segregate these four things permanently so that we can't go in between. It's not the case. God has worked in the way that from being unclean, we can become cleansed and go into clean state. And from there, we can be cleaner and go to, um, toward holiness. Or also, from the state of being clean, we can always go back to pollute ourselves and go back to the state of uncleanness. So, the Bible introduces us methods of a cleansing into holiness. First is with water, second is with fire, and third is through the blood. Cleansing with water. When we have a stain in our hands or a dust, we have to clean them out with water and they're all gone. Likewise, we can be cleansed but one downfall here is that even after we wash our hands, let's reach out to have some chicken, and it still stain our hands again. So being cleansed with the water means we can be dirty again. Now, in contrary, cleansing with fire, cleansing with fire, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, our God is a consuming fire. So fire consumes things. 
And so everything is consumed in fire, so those things cannot exist anymore. The third method of cleansing is blood. In Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, and says it's not just any blood, but the blood represents life because life is in the blood. Therefore, as we see in Romans chapter 6, verse 63, the wage of sin is death. So instead of this sin, God has shed his blood for life. That blood atones. The water, fire, and blood, they work together in offering. Offering is where these three components work together. So, for example, in burnt offering, in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 9, it says you have to cleanse entrails or organs of the offering animal with water. What happens after you wash it with the water? You burn it in the fire. Then in the fire, it's consumed. Then why do you wash it with water if you just burn it, right? You can just go directly into burning. And it will actually burn better if it's dry, it's not wet. So why do you wash it first? But the process of cleansing is washing away the sin of the offerer, the ones who are offering the offering. You know, the entrails is not just intestines that we can have at the Korean barbecue store, but it's actually everything inside the animal, but also the legs. Legs are the most dirty places because there are, are feces of the animals all over. So now we wash all of the animals clean, right? And when you burn that clean animal in the fire, then the burnt offering can be perfected. And it doesn't only end there. If you see in 1 John chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, Jesus Christ came with water and with the blood. Water means life, like water of life. So water is referring to the works of the Father God, God of Father. Jesus Christ came to this world with the word of the Father God and proclaimed the word according to the will of the Father. The blood is referring to the precious blood that Jesus Christ shed. And there is not only um, water and the blood, but also the fire, which is like Holy Spirit. So the work of salvation is done through the workings of God of Trinity. So the offering is where God forgives our sins with his blood and changes our status and then allow us to uh, have Holy Spirit in us. But then even if we were to sin continually after this, then we will find our own reflection in the Word of God and so that we can totally repent in the end and go through this process of transformation to attain eternal life in the end. And all of that is defined and explained in the offering. That's the offering actually shows the ways we must take to go closer to God. So in Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1 through 7, um, chapter 7, verse 38, talks about the five major offerings. And then we see, see Leviticus chapter 8, um, the people who have to officiate these offerings are the priests. So there is ordination, inauguration of the priests. And then, and in chapter 9, it actually shows the very first historic inauguration of the priest to officiate the very first offering. And it must be a very um, a nerve t nervous moment for the priest, right, to have the first officiating uh, of the uh, offering, right? If I remember when I first became pastor after, right after ordained, um, the very first benediction I had to do, I was so nervous. 
Um, uh, usually, I have a good site, and usually I use 12 fonts, in my, and I usually 10 fonts um, on my uh, notes. But this time, I printed 16 points of fonts because I was so afraid I might get really nervous, not be, not may, not might be able to read the script, right? Um, so you can imagine how nervous it would be for the priest to be ordained and inaugurated, right? But please note, on the same day, Nadab and Abihu sinned. So they failed in giving a, a proper offering to God. But God did not fire these priests, but God gave another way for them to be restored. And that is found in Leviticus chapter 11 all the way through 15. And it talks about uh, regulations regarding impurity and how to handle these impurities so that no matter um, how sinful we may be, uh, how unclean we may be, on one day of the year, everyone of the Israelites can become clean again, be atoned again, as called the Day of Atonement. And then in Leviticus chapter 17, all the verse 27, now have the instructions concerning this practical practice of a holiness. So we're going to take a look at the four methods of offering. First is through the burnt offering. Burnt offering is offered as a pleasing aroma through the burning. And the second is a drinking a, a drink offering. Drink offering is offered through pouring at water or wine. But once it is poured onto the ground, you cannot get it, get back, right? So once you pour it out, means you are giving everything we have to God. Third, the heave offering is to lift up and down as an offering. So it's a movement of upward, means to give to God, and then God gives us the back. So it's a repetition of moving up and down. And the fourth, the wave offering is not going up and down, but waving back and forth. Means I we give to God, and God gives to back. So you see the heave offering, the wave offering, these two can be very confusing. So again, the heave offering, heave offering is going up and down, up and down, a wave offering, and front and back, front and back. Okay. And so there are these four um, methods of offering. So now let's go to the point number two, laws of the five offerings. And we can't deal, uh, uh, look into everything, but let's take a look at the important points. Now, there are common elements of the five offerings. And it's Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1 through 2 is an introduction to these five offerings. Um, when uh, we offer five offerings, they must come from a flock. Flock. A, a herd or flock. Herd or a flock is behama in Hebrew word. It means not just any animal, but is a, a domesticated animal so that you have your ownership of this animal. It's not a some wild animal you get from hunting. It's a, a animal that you have purchased, that you have, um, you have, you own it. That doesn't mean that you can go and ask for someone else's a cow and give an offering. When Why? Because when we give offering, the offerer will have to lay his hand upon the animal. The moment that you lay your hand on it, impute, that is the moment all your sins are imputed upon, upon this animal. So... You cannot be one with something that has nothing to do with you. That's why you must bring something that you own, that is yours. The same way when we worship, Jesus Christ has become our spiritual offering. But that is only within the covenant. You are mine. I am yours. Only within the covenant we can offer these offerings in our worship. Now, let's go look at the first offering, burnt offering. Burnt offering is where you um, cut up the entire animal into pieces and burn as an offering to God. So we know this offering is burning. 
by first we have to look into the fact that they are cut into pieces. You know, everything that can um, show a prowess of the animal, like a mighty muscle or beautiful skin um, or uh, a beautiful fur, right? But anything that defines this animal to be beautiful um, is all cut away. The sk it's completely skinned. The beautiful muscle that the animal can be proud of, it is also chopped into pieces. In Hebrew um, translation, you're cutting in every s ligament. So the word netahu means to cut into pieces. It means you cut into pieces so that you can never tell the form or shape of the animal no longer. So when we are giving burnt offering, we are no longer alive. We give everything to God. Hey, God, I'm good looking. I have much possession. I have a good character. All these physical attributes or pride must be completely gone. We must be presented as dead. That is what true burnt offering is. And the most perfect burnt offering on this earth is when we give ourselves up completely. And that is only the offering of Jesus Christ because he gave himself up completely and gave himself to God wholly. So Jesus Christ gave the perfect burnt offering. Second is a grain offering. is the only offering without the sacrifice of an animal, usually given along with other offerings, like with um, a fine ground, finely grounded uh, flour and oil and frankincense. And you cannot have any leaven or honey. So this ground grain and is mixed with a oil and frankincense, but no honey, no leaven. Now we are we think the leaven is a bad word because we learned that from church. So okay, leaven, don't take don't put leaven in, we get it. But honey also is no. Why? Because we said the word is like a honey. Why? Because um, leaven and honey actually changes the actual um, nature of what it really is. For a small, tiny uh, leaven, it actually expands and really uh, into big volume, right? So, but you eat it, you still feel the same fullness, right? Honey. Now. Um, the unleavened bread is so it's not taste it's not tasty at all. It has no taste at it. it it's, there's no taste. So honey, if you dip it into honey, it tastes good and sweet, right? So when we are given to God, we should not like exaggerate ourselves, like expand ourselves, or put a honey as if we are tastier. No, there's no covering up. There's no. Um, um, changing, altering who we are when we give ourselves to God. We must give just as is. And also, we must know that it's finely grinded flour. So in order to uh, grind a flour, you have to grind about 10 to 13 hours. So fine ground is not like today where we can just put it in a mixer or just already buy a store-bought fine flour. But all day long, you have to dedicate your time and labor. And you give all of that to God. You see, the grain offering um, it reflects or signifies the grinding process. is where all the grains are bursted, ripped, and turns into a flower where you can no longer tell its shape. So this is same as how Jesus Christ came to this world and subjected to all suffering of being torn and ruptured for the sake of our sins. So I believe uh, as we give a grain offering, we should express our faithfulness and gratitude and holiness for what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Now third is peace offering. It is an offering to promote peace and fellowship between God and man. Now, this unique is that the offerer receives a portion. All of the other offerings, the priest received a portion after they offer it to God. 
But this peace offering is the only offering where the offerer also receives a portion. But the God does not just give, there is a condition to it. You have to eat it all up today or the, until the next day. If you have any leftover, then you have to consume it in the fire. But if it's still, uh, you didn't burn it and it is left, it still remains, then this offering will not bring peace with God, but rather become curse and bring um, wrath on them. So this is quite scary. You know, they wor worship to have peace with God, but rather it becomes a curse, right? The m reason I'm pointing this out is that when we give offering, you know, um, cows can weigh like 600 kilograms, really big. So you take out their entrails and burn it in the fire, and they cut the breast and the legs and give it all to um the priest, then if you t bring ev all the leftover back, then you have 300 kilograms of meat. It doesn't matter how big your family is, you cannot eat 300 kilograms of meat. Okay, well, we cannot give to other people, then we will just burn it. But you know, burning a 300 kilogram is not easy. You know, for il one kilogram of beef to cook, it takes a while, right? So you 300 kilograms is a lot. So the on, only way you can get rid of is to uh, give out to everybody. If you only give out to those people you like, your favor, then you're not going to be able to get rid, them out, get rid of them. You have to give out everybody, even those who you don't like, um, who are your boss or your subordinates, whatever, just anybody you have to give out. So the same way we can apply this to our worship today. Today we say, oh, I've been so blessed. But then some people say, I want to keep it to myself. No, it's not going to make you healthy. Actually, it's going to be poison. What kind of poison? Poison of arrogance. Oh, you don't know this word, do you? Oh, you're so ignorant. Without ourselves realizing how we are becoming, we become pride. So the blessing scene where God's blessing, uh, grace is poured upon us will change into curse. But when we share with other people, then the aroma of the worship will fill this earth. That is what the cross is. The cross of Jesus was not uh, the the grace of the cross was not limited only to those people who stayed with Jesus, but these people who cursed Jesus and who wanted to kill Jesus, even to them, the grace extends. The fourth is sin offering. Now, the sin offering is hata or hatat in Hebrew, but what is really interesting is a word. Um, Sin offering is hata, and the word sin is also hata. These both words are the same Hebrew word. What does it mean here? You see, you might worry, ooh, is this a wrong picture image right here? Um, I, I saw uh, this. This is a, an item that's sold in Israel. I don't know what it really says, but it says COVID-19. Okay, So this it was a, a really a... Um, a popular antibacterial that was sold during the COVID time. It is hit, hit. Now this word has the um, same consonant word as hatat. So the word sin offering is not a something that they will get rid of sin after you sin it, but it's like. Uh, sterilizing something so that you are um, sterilizing your wound. So that means you have to uncover the identity of sin, what causes sin, and sterilize that wound, right? So the purpose is to make it clean. And this sin offering is where... Um, 
emphasizes the role of the blood in purification. So for the high priest or the, for the multitude, if the sin offering is given, they will go into the sanctuary and sprinkle the blood in before the veils and before the, um, in, on the altar of incense. But if my status is a patriarch, uh, a leader of the tribe, or if the common people, lay people, then for your sin offering, that you'll put blood on the altar of the burnt offering outside. Why is there a distinction? Um, the leaders of the tribe and the lay people can come into the court, but they cannot go inside the, inside the tabernacle, right? Um, into the sanctuary. But um, the high priest and also the congregation are the people. Um, this is actually uh, combining the priests as well. So the priests can enter. So the most holy place only the high priest can enter, but into the sanctuary, um, priests can also enter. So when the high priest and the other priest, uh, the congregation sins, then when you go in there with a sin, then you can even defile the holy place, right? And that's why you must go in there and give the sin offering for them as well. And this actually represents uh, Jesus' atonement for the utterly corrupt and helpless humanity due to sin. And last, it last is guilt offering. Um, offering required for sins that demand restitution. So when there's a damage, then you pay for it. So if I cause damage of $1,000 to the other person, I have to give guilt offering for it $1,000 but also I have to pay restitution. So we give one-fifth of the amount as the restitution. It's not a concept of penalty or uh, punishment, but when you obey this word, you have to give one-fifth. You say, well, I gave $1,000 back already, and I have to give $200 more for this. But if you obey the word of God, and you give, and the, the other person receives that, then their relationships are restored. This is a purpose of the guilt offering. So for this offering, there is no record that God receives this offering. That doesn't mean that God does not receive this offering. In order for God to receive a perfected offering, you have to pay the restitution, and the person who received the restitution will also have to forgive the other. And that process must take place first for God to receive this offering. That's what guilt offering is about. Today, this guilt offering represents Jesus as the atonement for humans who are unaware of our sins. You know, we often think about, you know, someone who did this to me, did to that at church. But uh, I believe that we are all afflictors in the church because and the person who is damaged is always God. We cannot. Um, pay the restitution of one-fifth for the sins that we have committed, right? If we are the afflictor and God is the um, a victim, right? Because we say we do things, but we um, often do things against the will of God. And that, um, this offering is given by Jesus. Even for our own sins, we commit unknowingly against God. So, um, also, there are five offerings, and five offerings are eternal law. And also, this is found in Ezekiel's temple, and this is five offerings. And it's, for burnt offering, it is Ola Tamid, it means it's an offering that is every day. It's given every day in Exodus chapter 29, verse 38 to 39, in Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 33. 
And these are the offerings you give day and night. And until when um, we offer this? This is until forever, until we go into the kingdom of God. We see that this is at the same offering that we give in the Ezekiel's temple. In Ezekiel chapter 46, verse 13, it says, we give offering uh, morning by morning. Now, in the Ezekiel temple, it's morning by morning. Well, before we saw in other verses that this um, burnt offering is supposed to be given in morning and night. But we know that Ezekiel's temple, there is no night. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 5, that there will be no longer be any night. There will not have a need of light of a lamp or light of the sun because the Lord God will illumine them. Right? So, in Psalm 50, verse 5, God says, Gather my godly ones to me, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice, by offering. God did not make covenant only with Abraham, only with David, but with us also. When was there any torch, uh, flame, a flaming torch to pass through between us and God? Well, that spiritual torch is our worship. Even though we may live in unworthy ways um, during the weekdays, when we come to worship, then we are restored to the status of the covenant people. That's called the renewal of our status. Let's say, you know, we watch YouTube um, on a computer or a handphone, um, and then you um, hit the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the a fix button, then, you know, it actually refresh the screen, right? That's what worship is. It refreshes us. We are refreshed into the original state that we are supposed to be, and that is what the worships do. And thirdly, let's take a look at the ordination and inauguration of the priests. So we are going to actually to get um, take a look at the images as well. But to introduce you what the ordination is, ordination ceremony is when you um, establish the priests. But everything has to be done according to the word of God, every process. The ceremony was done precisely by God's direction. It's not made by Moses. It's not made by Aaron. It's completely by God's command. And it is by God's revelation. It's God's revelation. And secondly, it has to be done all publicly before the uh, people. Um, so it was conducted public, publicly before the congregation. God did not say, or Moses did not just bring Aaron and has done this privately, but it was done publicly. Why? Because God is making the covenant with all people, and because God is God of order, he has shown this order to which, by which he will rule over his people has been manifested to the people. Um, later on, we know that there is an incident of Korah factions. And what was really evil about them is that if they really thought that they were um, not uh, treated fairly, no, that's not just that. When they... They attacked Aaron, who was publicly uh, ordained before the people by God. Korah's action was actually done not against just Aaron, but it was against God himself. And thirdly, all procedures were performed by Moses. When um, the process, uh, sometimes uh, the, the process of the offering is different, is done by different people. For example, the offerer will bring in the animal, with the lay the hand upon the animal, 
and cut up the animal. And then the priest will take over and do the other parts of the offering. But for this inauguration, we see that Moses actually conducts all procedure because Aaron has not yet been ordained yet, right? There's no priest. And fourthly, the ceremony lasts seven days. And lastly, um, the ultimate purpose of the ceremony was the priest holiness. So let's take a look at the procedures of the ordination ceremony one by one. First is the preparation of the ordination offerings. Aaron and his sons will bring the offerings to Moses. Uh, to bring to God. And Moses reiterates that this is what God has commanded to do. And so shows that God is a lawgiver. He instituted all of these ordination steps. Secondly is a dressing ceremony for the high priest and the priests. You don't just wash the robes, uh, wear the robes, but first you have to be washed. You have to be cleansed, and then Moses uh, puts on the high priestly robe upon Aaron and the rest of the sons. And you see the Aaron's sons uh, will receive the garments as a last step. And the third, now uh, Moses offers... Uh, and then um, anoint, uh, Moses anoints Aaron's head with oil to set him apart. And then also uh, Moses dresses Aaron's sons in the holy garments. So after this uh, dressing ceremony is done, now the offering begins. First, a sin offering is given because everybody is a sinner. So when there are five offerings um, take place, sin offering is always given first. And you see that actually there is a very a detailed expression in Hebrew and the way they lay their hands. Now, lay their hands is samak. And actually means it's not just gently laying your hand upon the animal, but you're actually pressing on the animal with all your strength, reflecting that you're imputing all of your sins upon this animal. In Hebrew, it's written in the um, singular verb. That means one person is um, laying the hand on. But the hands itself are in plural, you know, because hands are always a pair number. So used both hands. One person used um, both hands. And then there are a um, also the plural prefixes, uh, suffixes. And so everybody is participating in the ordaining, um, laying their hands upon the animal. But it is Aaron, he himself puts his hands upon the animal. Everybody else um, is not actually doing it directly, right? You see in this image that it's only Aaron putting his own hands on the on the bowl, but the other sons lay their hands not on the animal but somewhere else. So it's Aaron is representing the um, laying the hand. And next, um, Moses. And now, um, because Aaron is not yet the high priest, he is not able to go into this holy place, but he actually um, puts the blood on the altar of the burnt offering in the court. Um, and fourth, the offering of a ram as a burnt offering for the ordination ceremony. This time, unlike last time where only Aaron put his hand to lay on the offering, this time Moses, uh, Aaron's sons also lay their hands upon this offering. And after this burnt offering, there is a peace offering, and they do um, uh, lay their hands on the same way. And after um, the ordination is done, there is an interesting um, part. They apply the blood to the priests, right earlobe, thumbs, and big toes of Aaron and his sons. And that means um, your ears, your feet, um, and your hands must always be pure and clean wherever you go. 
And then、um, there's a lastly cleansing ritual of sprinkling blood and anointing oil on the garments of Aaron the high priest and his sons. And after this, for seven days, you give a burnt offering. And this also is conducted by Moses. For seven days, every day, you offer a,、um, a bowl. Just because you give a sin offering, that doesn't mean that you don't give a daily burnt offering. You give daily burnt offering for seven days. And after that time, after seven weeks, the Uh, this daily burnt offering it takes place every day. So, this is how the seven day、um, ordination ends. And then now Israel has a high priest and a priest. And they now have intercessor and a mediator. Now, Israel is no longer a, just a nation, but it is a nation with a holy mediator. Where the people can now come closer to God. So then the whole nation will become the kingdom of priests. So with that first ordained high priest, now we get into, we can go into the inauguration. Now, first of all, there is a preparation of the ceremony. And now Moses does not do anything anymore. And now Aaron takes charge. Aaron kills the animal, Aaron burns the animal. And Aaron sacrifices the animal. So now Aaron not only gives burnt offering for his own、um, sin offering, but also for the entire people. And this is the historic first offering given by the high priest Aaron. And we can read、um, this entire process in more detail in the book. And so after the inauguration ended, Aaron comes out blessing everybody with great joy, but it doesn't end there. After that, Moses leads Aaron and goes back into the holy place. Now, this is the very first moment Aaron goes into the holy place. So, I hope that we can experience this through the video. We are going into the holy place and we can see this. Glorious light of God, right? In the old time, this is before the time when they have windows,、uh, glass to make a mirror, they use bronze or gold, these metals. So these mirrors will actually create endless space, right? Because they reflect each other. It's a very tiny space. When we go in there, we see the God's glory, the golden lights will be filled, and Aaron will see this light. And there, through Moses, he learns about everything and comes out of the holy place. After he comes out of the holy place, the Aaron blesses the people, and in this blessing, God's glory will be present. And God's glory will manifest through His answer through fire.、Um, this is, I hope that we can kind of experience this. After Aaron comes out of the holy place, and God answers with the fire of the Lord that comes down from heaven, and God shows the house receive this inauguration. He publicly shows this, and this fire. It came from God, from heaven. So, from the sun, whenever he gives a fire offering, he doesn't,、uh, Israelite don't use the fire from his flintstones, from his house, but he comes to the sanctuary, uses fire from the Lord to worship an offering. If people worship like this, then there will be no problem on that very day. This glory, this day sh is shattered. Nadab and Abihu this go into the sanctuary with the strange fire, not the fire commanded by God. And when the strange fire is what they brought, then God kills them both. Such tragedy unfolds on the very day of the ordination, of the very day of the inauguration. So Aaron. Is supposed to eat up all the priestly portion after offering, but he just burns them in the fire. So Moses asks, "How come you did not do this according to the law that you just were taught?" But Aaron says, "I am still a sinner. The sons 
after we finished this inauguration, we gave the first historic offering to God, and my sons have sinned, and we are still sinners. How can I eat something that was given to God as holy? How can I eat that? I'm not worthy. And Moses saw it right. So this offering was offering with blemish. It was not a perfect offering. When do the Israelites offer a perfect offering in the Old Testament? It's unfortunate, but for thousands of years, there is never once unblemished perfect offering. That's a shocking truth. Um, to understand this, we have to understand the dates more. And let's take a look at the whole process we just talked about. In the second year, the first uh, day of the second year, 1445 BC. Now, um, they give a dedication of the tabernacle. That's in Exodus 40, verse 2, verse 17. The first day of the first um uh, first day of the year in the second year is when they dedicated the temple. And on the day, day um, there was also a burnt offering and grain offering. But we see in Numbers chapter 7, verse 1 through 3, um, the 12 uh, tribes and the leaders come out with offering uh, for the altar ed- dedication. So now, f- by looking at the Bible, we all can pinpoint these dates. But after this, I believe we are seeing this for the first time in history. So we see every 12 tribes, leaders, they bring their offering to God and it's for 12 days. And so it's from the 2nd to the 13th. One um, leader from each tribe will come and give offering, burnt offering, guilt offering, and a peace offering. But, you know, there was never a, a time that they stopped this offering. So the tabernacle, once the ten tabernacle was dedicated, um, on the same day the offering was given, and then um, on the next day, the representative of Judah gave offering. Uh, represent, on, the, on the third, uh, representative of Issachar came out and gave offering. And every day, somebody from the tribe will come and give offering. So it never closed. It's open. It stayed open. And then on the 14th is the very first Passover in the wilderness. And in Numbers chapter 9, verse 1 through 5, and they kept the Passover. And on this day, when they were observing this Passover, it was before the priests were um, ordained. And this is actually the day when the ordination of the priests began and lasted for seven days. Um, Because during the seven days, there was a daily offering. So up to the 13th, the tribe leaders gave a burnt offering, right? By verse 14th, we see also another burnt offering through the seven-day ordination ceremony. And as this ordination ceremony lasts for seven days, and this is actually overlapping with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And now seven days after the Passover is called the um, a Feast of Unleavened Bread. So after the seven-day ordination of the priests, At the end of that seven days, you see there's inauguration, and that coincides with the last day of a Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the the, the day uh, day after the Sabbath, um, during the Unleavened Bread, it is the day of the first fruits. And so we can see that through the feast and its schedule, the first fruits here is what? Are the priests. Priests are the first fruit. And then so at the end of the ceremony for the ordination of the priests, at the end, there was inauguration ceremony. But unfortunately, we just saw that there is sin of native and abihud. The single 
page and calendar has never been um, dis shown or discussed in any book ever in history. I believe this is for the first time in history that we're able to see this so systematically. And we see that the word sign, just as in Genesis chapter 1 through 14, every date is also a sign of God. And as he, God orchestrated all of this every day precisely, it's proving how God um, has um, God has uh, planned and executed everything um, according to his time. And that's why in Proverbs, Chapter 25, verse 2, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of the king is to search out a matter. So God has embedded a this huge mystery about this time, and he concealed it. But once we search out the matter, that's also glory to God. See, so God, for his glory, concealed the matter. But who searched out the matter? The kings. And I believe as we turn to the book 12 to search out this matter, God has imputed upon us as the king, and it's also bringing glory to God. In conclusion, the most shocking um, line from the book 12, um, I believe, is this. The laws of offerings in the Old Testament serve as a blueprint for Jesus Christ's offering on the cross. So all the ancient practices of offering and sacrifice and the Israelite history, all of them have been a foreshadow of Jesus Christ's offering on the cross. Through the offerings, God wanted no one to say on the day when Jesus was hung on the cross as our offering and say Satan has won. He wanted everybody to understand that this was done according, I mean, precisely according to what God has shown for thousands of years to Israelite history. And let's actually briefly go into this little more exact timing of God. Uh, for Jewish one day, it's not from morning to night like we do. For Jewish one day is when the sun sets and the night and the day. Now, in this order, consists one day. Then we can go into the next table. And for AD 29, we see in Matthew chapter 20, uh, Luke chapter 23, verse 54, and John chapter 19, verse 31, it is called the preparation day. The preparation day um, in Greek is parskue. It means a preparation day. That means you prepare for the Passover. Parskue is usually referring to Friday because the Sabbath is the next day, right? So, we don't know what day exactly is, but the night of the Last Supper and the washing the feet was a Friday night. And you see, so that night of the beginning of the Friday night is when he did the Last Supper and washed the feet of the disciples and went to Gethsemane and prayed to the, through the night. And almost midnight, Jesus was arrested. And then in the morning, at 9 a.m., he was hung on the cross. So in Jewish ca calculation of the day, all of this occurred on the same day, Friday. And also there is a uh, first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Um, in the New Testament, Um, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread actually refers to the day of the Passover. It says it, they actually count in New Testament eight days, um, even though 
um, at seven days in the Old Testament. So they include the Passover as a first day as well. So on the next day, 14th Saturday, um, when Jesus Christ was buried in the tomb of Joseph Arimathea, now this day in John chapter 19, verse 31, is described as a high Sabbath or high day. When you say high Sabbath or high day, that means um, the uh, Passover and the Sabbath day, they overlap. Sabbath is Saturday, so you cannot um, change the Sabbath, right? So on, the, on cases like that, you will move the Passover to day earlier, right? Day earlier. So on AD 29, when Jesus died, was actually on the Passover, his last Passover was a day that's moved up ahead, one day. So he died on the Passover day, and this is so um, because the Passover was moved up one day, the start of the Feast of Unleavened Bread was also moved up on one day. So the very first day after Sabbath is a Feast of the First Fruits. That's the 15th and Sunday, and that is when Jesus resurrected at dawn. And that's why in Second Corinthians chapter, First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, Jesus became the first fruits. And Reverend Evan Park described this. I mean, 2005, Reverend Evan Park proclaimed this message during the Passion Week. And he says, the moment Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane was a day of the ordination and inauguration. And he said this over and over again throughout the sermon, but at the time we had no idea what he meant by this. But we now we realize that this is became um, the inauguration because for seven days, um, if once you are ordained as a high priest, a priest, you cannot get married to whoever you want to. Um, you cannot go to your families or you have to get rid of all your human stuff, uh, human things, just to come close to God. So Jesus, too, on the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed until the um, his sweat became blood drops. And he prayed and said that, uh, please let this cup pass from me, but not by my will, but by your will. He gave everything of that he had to God. And so this was the moment that he was um, ordained as the high priest. So then when we go back to the chart in 1929, we can see um, in 1944, uh, 1445, there was a uh, high priest, uh, the priest in ordination and inauguration. It began on the Passover, and then it um, ended with the first fruit. But because of Nadab and Abihu's um, sin, it actually, um, the worship actually became shattered. It became perfect offering. However, in 29 AD, Jesus Christ offered himself on the cross. On the day of the Passover, he was hung on the cross. And then on the first fruit, Feast of First Fruits, when he resurrected, and that's how he was able to accomplish a perfect offering on the cross once for all. And so for us today, we have been called from the spiritual world of Egypt. And God has called us as a, a priest, as kings, and called as the first fruits. And I believe we also must give a perfect offering by following Jesus Christ. And secondly, I would like to look at John chapter 4 to conclude. As Jesus was having conversation with the woman of Sikar, by the well, um, the woman says, uh, my ancestors... Um, uh, worshipped at Samaria, uh, your people worshipped in Jerusalem. I said, which one is right? Jesus did not say, well, that mountain or this mountain. He only says, no, you have to worship in the truth and the spirit. We Pyongyang Church is really having a, a challenging time at the moment, but nevertheless, 
The work of the word is moving forward without ceasing, and the word uh, is powerfully teaching us where we must be. We can be asked, um, is it real worship to uh, worship? Is it real worship only when we uh, give worship here inside the church, or is can be a worship outside church? Jesus would say, no, you have to worship inside or outside. He says you have to worship in the truth and the spirit. You have to really sincerely worship. By God's grace, um, we are able to um, have this book 12. And I believe that through these offerings and these laws, that we can have restoration of our true worship. And I think that is the greatest blessing. The Bible testifies of the Bible. Bible attests the Bible. As we read the Bible, we can say, oh, something is missing from the Bible. It's something we should add this to the Bible. There's not a single spot in the Bible we can say like that. And so Bible has a self, um, the Bible is self-expounding. Um, so Bible has a, a authority to testify itself because nothing lacks we can't say, oh, I received this something special, so we need to add this extra line into the Bible. There is no area in the Bible that we can say about the church, uh, about the Bible, and there's nobody. Um, so during the time in the Bible um, was written, there are some people who say, well, Jesus said this to me, so I have to put this in there, or we have to do this, and they um, end up making a pseudo Bible, right? So I believe that uh, we are blessed by God and called us into a true restoration of worship. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your abundant love and grace. Um, by your amazing grace, you have given us the book 12 to teach us what is a right way to worship you, what is a true worship that we can offer you. We thank you so much for teaching us through these um, laws of offering. Father, as we read this book 12, may we not only be um, more smart about this, but may there be great transformation in our worship. Father, we pray that our worship can be without blemish. So please help us to transform our deeds and actions and give us a Holy Spirit so that we are able to conform to your heart whenever we read the book. And we are so thankful for these offerings, for time, so we give these offerings to you. Wherever, um, Please receive these offerings and bless these offerings so that it can help to expand your kingdom and your work of redemption. Thank you for always being with us. We pray all of this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ in thanksgiving. Amen.